Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 7th, 2009, and my guest is Christopher Hitchens. He's the author of many books, essays, and articles, including the book Why Orwell Matters, which is our topic for today. Welcome to Econ Talk. Nice of you to have me. You start by saying that Orwell was right about the three big issues of the 20th century, imperialism, fascism, and Stalinism. Give us the flavor of what he was right about. Well, to take them in that order, which is the order in which they occur, and also, I think, probably the necessary order. Orwell's first rebellion against power, illegitimate power as he thought of it, was against the assumption that the world would be ruled indefinitely by white Europeans and that Indians, Africans, Chinese and Latin Americans, people like that would just have to lump it. He saw with great prescience that that wasn't going to last very much longer anyway, whether it was justifiable or not. He'd also, as a colonial policeman in Burma, which was then part of the British Empire in Asia, seen the ugly side of it. And I think had guessed at the dirty secret that underlay it, the, um, the master-slave relationship, as Nietzsche calls it, uh, and the unpleasant sexual side of that, which is available to you if you read his novel, Burmese Days. I'll phrase it as crisply as I can. Um, the most it's a family ed- show. So. Yeah, of course, um, and with, with uh, due regard to, to the, uh, the values of that. Um, the best way of putting it would be that the most qualified and educated... Burmese man would never be allowed as a member of the English club in town, uh, hard as he might try. But the least educated Burmese woman would be admitted to the British colonial officer's mansion by the back door as, well, at best a mistress. In fact, Flory, the, the policeman in Orwell's novel, Burmese Days, has, it turns out, actually bought his woman as a concubine from her family. So she's in effect, effect uh, uh, something like a comfort woman or a slave. I think myself, no one, no one knows, because there's no writing about it that survives of his, no one knows why Orwell came back on leave and resigned his commission in that police force. But I believe I do know the reason. I think he thought if he went on doing it, he would become a sadist and a racist, and he'd already become a bit of both of those things. And it's a great help if you're going to be an anti-fascist, which he later becomes, to have some insight into the horrible... Um, psychodramatic nature of, of fascism. It's it, the sexual warp that is part of it, the, the, the thrill of domination. And not just the thrill of domination, but the thrill of being dominated. Um, this is eternally present in all of Orwell's writing. Gives him an insight that many others don't possess. He understands immediately that there's something utterly wicked and pornographic about fascism. It has to be resisted. It's a life and death question. He hardly even writes anything against it. It's so obvious to him it has to be opposed. Goes off to fight. So, and early in Spain, and therefore that's number you can cross off the second of the two that you mentioned. He's, uh, I want you to, he's I want, a prescient opponent of fascism. I want you to give a little background of his Spanish involvement well, for, that's, for listeners who may not be indeed, aware of the no, Spanish uh, Civil War. The, um, in Spain in 1936, the Spanish people elected a government that was, uh, broadly speaking, as we call it, Republican. It, it was hostile to the traditional ancient Spanish, Castilian Spanish monarchy, critical of the power of the church and the undue economic influence of the church, generally secular, left-leaning, a great, a great threat to traditional Spain, which replied in the form of a military coup organized from its African colonies by General Franco to uh, put down Castilian, uh, sorry, to put down Catalan, Catalonian and Basque nationalism, which were also part of the Republican cause restore the Catholic, Christian, centralized, Madrid-based unity of Spain. On, a, on, a, on again, the traditional monarchist and feudal basis. And wasn't ashamed in this enterprise to ask for the military help of Hitler and Mussolini, which was what made it an international cause. So those who had decided that Hitler and Mussolini had already gone far enough, um, many of them were brave enough to take themselves physically to Spain to fight in the armies of the Republic as volunteers. Which in turn 
that side Orwell. was supported by... Orwell was one of those. <clears throat> now, so now I think, I've, I hope I've tried to explain, succeeded in explaining some of the transition between Orwell's anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, anti-racism, and his anti-fascism and anti-Nazism, but here, here's where he becomes an immortal figure instead of just a distinguished one. Within the civil war in Spain, there was also a civil war. There was a civil war within the left. Because as a counterweight to the support of Franco by Hitler and Mussolini, the Spanish Republic turned for, for arms and for money and for diplomatic support to Stalin's Russia, which was believed by many people at the time, many of the working class, and many of the intellectual classes too, to be a, a new utopia, to have solved the problems of racism, colonialism, imperialism, Class, capitalism, fascism, capitalism. To have, who needs any more to ask any, any questions? We already have a heaven on earth, it's on the other side of the Ural Mountains, far away, but ruled by a beneficent, uh, godlike uh, person out of whose bottom the sun daily shines. Joseph Stalin, Joseph Vissarionovich Dugashvili, the greatest uh, Georgian of his generation. He, discovering that this was a huge lie and that those who believed it were capable of anything was Orwell's third greatest achievement. And he did it while he was accused of something that must have wounded him very much, um, accused of undermining the anti-fascist front by telling the truth. Put yourself in that position. What am I supposed to do? I, I, if I tell the truth, I'm going to be accused of undermining the left in its hour of need in Spain. I'm going to tell the truth anyway. I'm going to say what is obvious to me. Communism is a fraud, at best. And, and a monstrous uh, tyranny, um, more probably. And I've seen it in action. I know what it's like. Um, and not all your listeners will know who Sheswell Miwash was, but some of them will. Well, he's dead now. He died at the age of about 98. He was the greatest Polish intellectual of the 20th century, seconded only by Leszek Kolakowski. And he wrote a famous book called The Captive Mind, which was a big bestseller in the United States in the 1950s when he, he Milos, <coughs> um, left Poland, having been a communist, left the Polish government, moved to the United States and began That's to... the poet. He's a poet. Yeah, yeah. A very famous poet yeah. and essayist. Yeah, got the Nobel Prize. Well. Yeah, and Nobel yeah. Um, you just say his name so well. It's because I pronounce it as the Poles do, because <laughs> yeah. I'm such a, a, a faggot for this kind of thing. Polophobe. Yeah, I mean, a polophobe. Yeah, because of the W's being, uh, the, the being a special L in Polish. That's, uh, so you actually pronounce, it's, it's spelled Szeszlo Milosz, but it's pronounced Szeszlo Miłosz. Uh -huh. Anyway, in The Captive Mind, he says that when he got hold of a pirate edition of 1984, which was being passed around in, inside the Communist Party in Poland, in secret, read by the cognoscenti, they were all absolutely amazed. How does this guy understand so well how the system works? And wh when they found out who the author was, and that was an Englishman who had never been to the Soviet Union, who'd never been to a communist country, if that's not possible. He can't have got it so right without having lived under it. There's something wrong here. When you think that <clears throat> um, Milos is passing around a secret book within the inner party, and that 1984 is about the passing around of a secret book within the inner, inner party, and it's in 1951 that he writes this, and about roughly 1950 that the book comes out, I think it's probably one of the greatest compliments ever paid by one author to another. Orwell never lives to see Milos publish this. Miłosz, I should say. <laughs> but, in fact, in Catalonia, in Barcelona, the capital of Catalonia, Orwell had lived under, briefly, a communist regime, before most people had in Europe. He'd, he'd seen what the Communist Party was like and how it behaved when it was in the saddle, when it thought it was on the winning side. And he'd, he'd, he'd known what it was to live under a terror and to have people disappear without explanation and to have censorship and fear. Uh, if only for a brief time, it was a lesson for for life and for the rest of his life, which was to consist of another decade and a bit, he devoted himself to combating the, the prevalent illusion among intellectuals, which was that communism was the future. And um, if you like, uh, that, that would be a radiant and a nice future. He said it's neither. It, it's horrible and it will fail. And thus the, the closing years of his life were just spent desperately ill fighting tuberculosis see the publishing of a lot of very important anti-communist essays, but the two great classic novels, 
um, animal farm and uh, as he's dying in 1984. Mm -hmm. So that's number three, and number three is a synthesis of the previous two. Uh, in other words, I think in his 46 years, you can think of his life as being all of a piece in that he was able to diagnose, analyze, and fictionalize, and, and critically oppose all the forms of illegitimate power of man over man that the 20th century was able to, and the 19th, had been able to furnish us. And wrote, trumpeted a warning uh, that we still listen to and still hear. It's, it's a, really a rather an incredible thing how well read, people still read his books, they still talk about his ideas. Those are the things he opposed. Tell us what he was pro. He was anti-imperialist, anti-fascist, anti-Stalinist. What did he embrace? What was he pro? Um, and we'll talk in a little bit, I will, just to set it up, we're going to talk a little about whether he was a man of the left or the right. Um, it's not so easy to talk about what he was pro, given what he was opposed to. It's not, it doesn't naturally follow something. He was a natural egalitarian. He didn't have much use for any form of privilege. He was rather an austere person. One can picture him as a soldier, actually probably a junior officer in, say, Oliver Cromwell's army. He was a bit of a Puritan. Strict, but not humorless. Very suspicious of any, anything overtly or um, too overtly ornate or decorative, such as monarchy or the, the flummery of religion, which he always despised. Um, very fond of the English people. There's a lot of talk about how he was quintessentially English, though, in fact, the first book he ever wrote was a critique written in French of British oppression of Burma, British economic exploitation of Burma. How Britain underdevelops Burma, it was called. He spoke perfect French. His, his most English-centered novel, it's called Coming Up for Air, it's about nostalgia for the English countryside in the Thames Valley. It was actually written in Morocco. <laughs> um, he fought in Spain and was wounded, very nearly killed, uh, shot in the throat. Um, he was a policeman in Burma. He, was very he spoke several Burmese regional languages and also Hindi. So he was extremely untypical as an Englishman. But he liked the, and here's a word one can't avoid in discussing him, the decency of the English people. He thought that they were humane, that they were friendly, that they had a, an innate sense of fairness and generosity. Um, he thought that, in fact, you, they were so nice you could even make socialists of them because an English socialism would have to be free of the deformities. I, sus I secretly suspect he thought were largely imported by sort of continental types who didn't have our advantages. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I think that that is true uh -huh. of him. But he was a socialist. He was a socialist to the end of his life, and he actually joined. Uh, the only party he ever joined was a group called the Independent Labour Party, a left splinter from the old Labour Party, that was associated with the writing and the resistance to Stalin of uh, Leon Trotsky. And that's why, when he went to Spain, instead of joining, as most of the volunteers for the Republic did, the International Brigade, which was run as a front organization, though not everyone knew it by the... Well, the whole point, of course, is not everyone knows it. Uh, <laughs> it's by it's the front, yeah. an AstroTurf organization instead of a grassroots one. Um, by the Communist Party. He, he ended up in a small, smaller, more left, more radical a group called the Partido Obrera Unificación Marxista. Boom. Workers' Party of Marxist Unification, which was not exactly a Trotskyist group, but was identified with the left opposition to Stalin. And if he hadn't, by that odd coincidence drifted into that group, he might not have been able to tell the truth as he saw it, and as we now know it to have been true, about what the communists were doing in Spain in, in those days, and not just in Spain. The midnight of the century, as people used to refer to it, the time of the Hitler-Stalin pact, or the rehearsal for it, when the two great totalitarian empires of Europe suddenly decide they have what is obvious to everyone, or should have been, more in common with each other than with democracy and make a formal military pact. The, the worst moment of all. That when it was broken, of course, S Stalin just couldn't believe it. It's one of the stranger moments in history, right? That when Hitler invades 
Russia, Soviet Union, uh, I'm told that Stalin refused to believe the, the accounts. He it's just, true, it's absolutely true. Um, <clears throat> Trotsky, who predicted it, he saw that after Neville Chamberlain had produced the sellout at Munich, that's known to all, where, as Trotsky put it, the British Conservatives would sell democracy everywhere in Europe if it would give them 10 more years' domination of India, which was what Hitler was offering them. Mm. Hitler's, Hitler's exchange proposal was, leave Europe to me, I'll, I won't attack you or your empire. We do our, our own carve up. Trotsky says, now Mr. Chamberlain has done that, the next move is obvious, Mr. Hitler will now make a pact with Mr. Stalin. That's his logical next move, he's been freed to do it. And he just happens to add, because Trotsky had this wonderful power sometimes of pressing. He said, and by the way, when this pact breaks down, it won't be Stalin who breaks it. Hmm. Weird. I mean, someone could have got 90% of that right. To get it 110% yeah, right is quite good. Yeah, that's incredible. Can I talk about the Spanish Civil War for a minute? Because for that generation, it was the transcendent international event. It's almost unimaginable to us today that intellectual elites volunteered to go fight and risk their lives. When we think of all the causes that the intellectual elites have followed since then, most of them don't involve personal risk. They involve standing back from the fray and cherry-picking mm -hmm. points and making easy pat remarks. It's hard to imagine that the great writers of today would go to, I mean, the only thing I can think of that's even vaguely analogous would be the, uh, the football player who volunteered to go to Iraq at the beginning of the Iraq War. Um, Mr. Tillman. And, no? But no, I can't remember. Who was it? I'm ashamed it I can't remember his name. Gave up, it was a man who gave up, was Ben Tillman. Yeah, Tillman. And, but, I don't know what game he played. He was a famous sportsman. He's a he, football player. He gave up a huge... He was, a, he was, a, he was killed in Afghanistan, yeah, he was a, unfortunately, by our side. And he was a, you know, a successful athlete. Mm. But the idea no, that... No, no, I mean, you're, you're picking the wrong analogy. The analogy is with um, the support of many uh, European intellectuals and poets for the uh, Greek War of Independence, the Greek Revolution against the Ottoman Empire in the 1820s, where the most famous figure, of course, is... is George Noel Gordon, better known as Lord Byron, who died of Missolonghi, not in battle, but of, of disease, but died having tried to help raise um, the contingent to fight for the freedom of Greece. But that was then, right? Yes, so but it was, it was very much, that is what gives birth to the idea of the Romantic movement, which is a huge influence throughout the But what century. tells it? Why is it that that, to me, well, what, you, a, maybe you disagree Spain, with but me. In Spain, by the way, it, isn't, it is true, of course, that a number of writers and intellectuals and poets in England, very famously, um, W. H. Auden, um, Stephen Spender, at least visited Spain if they didn't fight there. John Cornford, a great poet and contemporary of theirs, was killed there as a member of the Communist Party. Um, innumerable other writers of less renown were associated with yeah. it. But the ranks of the International Brigade were largely made up of Jewish garment workers from the East End of London, Welsh coal miners, Scottish coal miners, <laughs> engineers from the Midlands, uh, people who had seen, here's what I think is the crucial thing, the labor movement of Germany, the, the, the most important labor movement in history, the most successful, the best organized, the most democratic, go under to, to Hitler without a shot being fired. We'd seen the same happen in, in Austria in 1934, seen the... Uh, the, the workers' districts of Vienna reduced to rubble by artillery um, uh, with barely resistance. Um, it's seen one after another, the great, the great achievements of European socialism and the European labor movement just fall into <coughs> fascism and decided that not in Spain. In Spain, we're going to draw the line. The working, mm. class, the working class is going to fight back now. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, they shall not pass was the slogan. No pass around. This time there will be a, there'll be a fight. They did prevent the fascists from taking Madrid at the Battle of Harama. Uh, it's still a song and story and legend that not not all the compromises with and subversion of the cause by Stalinism uh, can take away. The international brigades for a while barred the road to fascism with their bodies in Spain. No one who's read the story properly can be, I think. Uh, unaffected by it 
emotionally or fail to think of it as being a, as Bernard Knox, the great classicist who went to fight that as well, he's still alive, at the age of 95. He said, can fail to think about it whenever they think about it as being a personal as well as a political tragedy that they lost. I like your, is it your so phrase? Well, you see, to take on these people, people of this prestige at the time, literary prestige, political prestige, moral prestige, class prestige, if you want, um, all of this, and say, yes, you're quite right, we have to bar the road to fascism, but you're quite wrong in saying that you have to do it as a communist. That, that's, that's to become the loneliest person in the world. Yeah, it's a little subtle for most people, a little too it's subtle. It's to risk complete, iso- not just isolation, but the worst kinds of calumny and slander, which are indeed going to fall on him. He's going to be accused of every kind of treason and treachery and lying. When he wrote his book, 1984, first, about the loneliness of Winston Smith, the person who thinks he may be the only person left in the world who's seen through Big Brother. Its working title was The Last Man in Europe. When he handed it in to Martin Secker at Second World Book, that's what it was called. Martin Secker was the first person in Europe to read it and said, I think we need another title. But, um, and I think he was right, by the way. But that's the way Orwell thought of himself. <clears throat> yes, extent. these, without becoming a, a monomaniac or an egomaniac, I mean to say, without becoming too solipsistic about himself. He remained always a fairly modest person, but he, he could have fallen victim to the temptation to think he was the lone prophet crying in the wilderness. Jeremiah. With no one listening. Yeah. Yes. Is it your phrase, the power of facing? Is that, is that yours? Or is it... No, it's his. I wanted to call my book A Power of Facing. Maybe. Just explain the phrase. Orwell said, um, when it, I think it's in his essay, why I write. He said that from a fairly young age he always knew what he want, wanted to do, <clears throat> which was to be an independent writer. And he said he knew he had um, for this task already the following two bits of equipment, um, a certain literary ability and a power of facing unpleasant facts. It's oddly um, constructed phrase. One might say the ability to face or right. the awareness of or the, the unwillingness to duck. It's just a power of facing. I thought it was just... It's a beautiful one. It's very good. And his willingness to see facts that were not conducive to peace of mind or a, a docile party line attitude or an ability to go along to get along. He would always notice that how the facts are stubborn things, as John Adams put it. By the way, I'd like you to ask me a question about John Adams in a moment. All right. If I was going to ask back, something about Thomas Jefferson. But well, the, 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 the same. Not to allow myself too long a throat clearing here, but having said, I hope convincingly, that on the three critical points of the 20th century, he was right. I should say the one critical uh, aspect of the century I think he got wrong, or didn't get right, at any rate, and that's the rise to prominence of America the United States of America and the American idea. Orwell had reservations about America that were partly cultural. He had the slight English snobbery about American mass culture, though he admired aspects of it. Um, he would like Mark Twain, for example, very much, and he didn't like American films. He didn't like American comic books. He thought they were a bad influence on English youth. He also saw that though the British Empire was bad, that taking over of its colonies by America that was coming, clearly, might not be that wonderful either. He was in touch with some good people in the United States, around the Partisan Review group, men like Dwight MacDonald, Philip Rav, wrote a letter from London for them. They tried to encourage him to come to America, probably to have his TB cured, which would have been good. And he wanted to make a trip down the Mississippi but he died before he could make it. I wish we had had Orwell on the Mississippi. Um, but most of what he writes about America is either rather slight or rather condescending. It has to be admitted. He didn't have enough of a historic sense of its rise and importance. But here's something I think I'm the only person to have noticed. At the opening of 1984, what is the, what is the opening sentence of the novel? You don't have to. I'm only asking rhetorically. The opening sentence is... It was a bright, cold day in April, 
and all the clocks were striking 13. And so that's how the novel, you suddenly know you're in another world. When I wrote my book, I, I didn't know that John Adams had said, when he was trying to get the Declaration of Independence organized, we have to make 13 clocks all strike at the same time. Hmm. It won't work unless all 13 colonies join at the same moment. Didn't, I hadn't known that, but I had noticed, and it is in my book, that in the Dictionary of Newspeak, that's the end of 1984, when he, he describes the, the new language of totalitarianism, the, the attempt to organize a dictionary that makes certain thoughts unthinkable, certain concepts unavailable to the human mind, by jargonized propagandistic language, he gives an example of a sentence that couldn't be rendered in Newspeak, and it's this. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That's how it begins. I don't have to finish it for you. Now, the Jeffersonian preamble could not be rendered into newspeak. Um, now, I, it would be wonderful if I could show that he knew that the first sentence is also an echo of John Adams, because the, the um, Jeffersonian is almost the bookend at the end, because the, the newspeak dictionary is an appendix to the book. But I think he had studied and, and appreciated the American Revolution. I know he was an admirer of Thomas Paine, as all English pamphleteers and radicals were. And so one of the many senses of the unfinished that one has with Orwell, so, so awful that he drowns in his own exploded lungs, of a poverty disease, like a Dickensian death, yeah. totally avoidable at the age of 46, at the height of his powers. One of the, one of the things is uh, that we'll never get to hear how fruitful a proper engagement between him and America might have become. Talk about Orwell's view of language, which you also mentioned talk about quite quite a bit about it in the book. What was his um, contribution there? Why does Orwell still matter when we think about language? Well, Orwell thought that a lot of uh, the work of, of um, illegitimate power is done for it by slave volunteers who all they need to do is to use the what the French call the langue du bois, the wooden tongue, the, the tongue that has removed all meaning from language. In other words, that you would describe, say, um, the forced confiscation and dispossession of agricultural workers as collectivization. Half the job is done. If, you, if the government can get it called that, they're halfway there. Um, euphemism was the thing that he was best noticing. Uh, so a euphemism I would define as the, the, the finding of a nice word for a nasty thing. So, ugh, um, there are so many. I suppose the, the best, the most famous one now, so famous that no one ever tries it, is, would be collateral damage for civilian casualties. No one would have, I think, the, no one would be able to say that with a straight face anymore. Um, even to say, uh, use the word purge, which we now, of course, think of as a hateful word. We didn't at the time. Purge is a, a cleansing. Yeah, it sounds good. For... Uh, the mur mass murder or by show trial and uh, disappearance and secret execution of your political opponents, say. Appeasement, remember, at the time, was the word that the Tories themselves used. Appeasement means the peace peaceful, yeah. com peaceful composition of differences, the slaking of certain... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an agreeable word. Right. So, so you it's only through history that it's become... Yes, as the word shape. collaboration does, doesn't ever have, again, the same, quite the same ring as it, as it once did. So that's, of course, the revenge of history on euphemism, that the euphemisms <laughs> themselves become. Yeah. Um, as we would now, if I was to describe you as ethically challenged, yeah. um, you would know that there was a deadly sting to that, because it was once a word that was used to soften the description of something disagreeable, such as disability, or crippledom, yeah. to give it its right. So, so Orwell was, very, was dead set against all that, and he gave Tremendous examples in his in his criticism, uh, his essayistic literary criticism of the way in which propaganda imports itself into the language and, and putting people on their guard against it. And he he taught not just his own generation but succeeding ones the importance of that. It's so impossible many, to overestimate it. So many of his fictional euphemisms became the real thing. Big Brother is not a right. We think of Big Brother as a frightening phrase. It's obviously was meant to be a term of familial warmth and affection Absolutely. by Big Brother, but we now know it because of Orwell as a 
it's become synonymous with, with evil and uh, oppression. Precisely. It's a little strange that people use his name as an adjective to mean the misuse of language. Well, it's Something funny. is Orwellian means it's, yes, it's a it euphemism. Would, it's like people say Kafka-esque or something that Kafka would have hated. <laughs> it's true. Uh, it, uh, this is pardonable, I think. I mean, one can't probably avoid it. But when, if, if you describe a person as an Orwellian, you pay them a compliment. Yeah. Um, if you describe a situation as Orwellian, you're describing something that's very dark. Hell. Possibly, um, and here's where the uses of pessimism may come in. Uh, possibly so dark as to be without a dawn. Um, I think it may have been Lyle Trilling. At any rate, it was one of his contemporaries who said of 1984 that the power of it was to completely foreclose any hope by the end. There's nothing Winston Smith can possibly do. He, he's been totally broken. Not just broken, he's been recruited. He loves me, brother. Um, there's the, the last man in Europe, the last dissident, has been tamed. The argument that many people made at the time, Isaac Deutscher, who I otherwise admire, made this case. So this is a situation that encourages people to despair. It, it teaches people that there's nothing you can do. It's reactionary in that sense. Others, I think, a bit, a bit more alive to it. <laughs> well, I think, I think Deutscher meant it genuinely. Yeah. Others more, a little more alive to, the, to what Orwell was trying to do said no, because if you, if you can imagine it being that bad, you can in fact imagine not overcoming it, but preventing it. Yeah, it was a, it was a klaxon. It was Don't a, think yourself into Winston Smith's situation. Think of what you can do to stop yourself from collaborating and becoming someone in that situation. And in that respect, we can say that the book is genuinely historic because the impact that it had in the enslaved uh, countries of the Soviet sphere among not just intellectuals, but people who later became leaders of independent trade unions and so forth, can't, cannot be overstated. And how do we know that? I've met people in Czechoslovakia, as it then was, the Czech and Slovak lands, in Poland, in East Germany, who were enormously affected by reading Animal Farm and or 1984 in various Samizdat editions. Orwell was um, very insistent that he would allow these books to be translated and distributed originally in Ukrainian. In fact, the only intro he wrote to 1984 was for a pirate Ukrainian edition produced by a group of rank and file Ukrainian socialists who'd been prisoners of war and were in a displaced persons camp in 1945. So you can have the book. You can have the copyright. Here's my introduction. Here's why the book is not anti-socialist, but it's anti-Stalin. Here's why it's on the side of freedom. Um, it's not Cold War propaganda. It's not, it's not, it doesn't come from a supporter of British imperialism. Important in itself, by kind the way, important. I yeah. think. Oh. Um, well, th th this example was followed uh, by pirate editions in every known language, and I'm willing to bet you that something will happen in my lifetime and yours. It, 1984 is not yet available in Chinese, or not in mainland China, but it will. Mm, no I doubt. predict there will be an edition of it. No doubt. And Animal Farm has been produced as a musical in Beijing. I'd love to see. <laughs> I have not attended a performance. It is not yet available, um, except that any Chinese person would now know how to get hold of some version of it on the internet. And there will be a, uh, there'll be a North Korean version. Yes, sir. Um, there will, because, um, because no one has ever been able to go to North Korea, as I have. Myself, I'm one of the few. Um, without surveying the most perfected, hideous, version of totalitarianism that still survives and or that may ever have been attempted without immediately having recourse to a, a quotation from 1984. It's impossible to see it or even think about it without thinking about Orwell. This is an achievement of quite a high order. It means that the, the relevance of the book will go on and it possibly become even more acute. And I'll, I'll add one more thing, which is that Animal Farm is banned by the Ministry of Education in almost every Islamic country. 
um, in some cases, because of its mention of pigs, but not all mentions of pigs are forbidden by Islam. Pigs, are, pigs can be understood, and after all, pigs are not represented exactly in a heroic light in Animal Farm. No, it's very clear, and it was made very clear indeed by the prohibition on it um, in Iran that it is banned as a satire upon absolutism. It's banned in the same way as the Shah of Iran didn't like having public performances of Macbeth. <laughs> uh, so it, again, it has, um, in these <clears throat> attacks upon itself, it earns the compliments that are, that are only accrued by great literature. Now, you've mentioned in passing something you talk about uh, at length in the book, which is the left's reaction to Orwell. And I think the way you put it is, it's, it's a little strange that an anti-imperialist, anti-imperialist uh, a deep defender of the working class, and a strong egalitarian should be um, almost um, caricatured when talked about by the left. So talk about why that is. You've sort of mentioned it in passing yes. already, but talk about it in more detail. There's a, there's a deadly a trap door built into um, a large uh, floor of the left mentality. If I haven't mixed the metaphor by phrasing it out, I don't think I have. I mean, it's this, that there's the, the, it's quite right to value solidarity. It's quite right to value uh, fraternity. And all of these things that keep the movement together uh, in hard times. But what this can undervalue, or, or even uh, sus uh, treat with suspicion, is the person who thinks for himself or herself. It can be suspected of being a, a traitor, a blackleg, someone who lets down the, the front of solidarity, the fraternity that's necessary in, in a war. And, um, Her worse gives comfort to the other side. In fact, the, the vulgar phrase for this, which isn't a leftist phrase, actually, it's a sort of phrase that any public school or regimental or um, team spirit a conservative would recognize, too. You know, you don't give aid and comfort to the enemy, you don't spread alarm and despondency in your, on your own side. It's a tribal feeling rather than a leftist one, but it, it is, it's peculiar to the left in, in that it can be like being a strike breaker or um, someone who, who is a traitor. And a scab, by the way, is well, not a euphemism. No, scab, no, scab <laughs> is not indeed, not, by no means, nor, nor in a way is blackleg or yeah. scab herder or any of the other uh, equivalent terms. And the, this has a, <clears throat> another element of, uh, that's, I would say, a leftist one in its way, which is uh, an, a form of leveling rather than a form of egalitarianism, but that says that uh, people who do such things do so for the lowest motive. That once you've found the lowest motive for someone breaking ranks, you've probably found the correct one, in other words. So that uh, I, in my own lifetime, I met uh, Claude Coburn, who was a very, very important journalist on the left in the 30s and, and subsequently, uh, until his death, actually, um, in the early 80s. I so was a, considered a, a very admirable man, despite his long, long membership in the Communist Party. And he was indeed a very brave and very humorous and, and very original writer, but he believed that Orwell and those like him in Spain who had criticized the Popular Front and the the Soviet role in it, were consciously doing the work of Hitler. Consciously, consciously that's the key work, yes. yeah. part. That it was not that their, that their work, as it were, objectively <clears throat> had the, um, your readers, your viewers, I should say, your listeners, your audience can't see me doing my air quotes, but objectively doing the work of the other side, but no, were knowingly doing the work of the other side. So an anti-communist is, is pro-fascist, almost, well, by definition. Well, by a certain uh, metric, yeah. uh, the, it, it must be so. Um, and that's what the Daily Worker said. Um, and they spread all kinds of other uh, communist inspired slanders against all, all of them, having the effect of attacking his motives, his character. Anything rather than... Uh, engage with yeah. and, and uh, made a very spirited and quite successful attempts 
to make sure that his work from Spain did not see print. It didn't get printed in the New Statesman, which had a very strong fellow traveling wing at the time. It was the leading left cultural magazine in Britain. I used to work for it myself in the 30s. It was, you could say it had the combined effect in Britain and British English-speaking world of the New Republic and the nation combined. They, they were strong enough to make sure that he never got published there, whereas the place that would have been most important to publish him. Uh, that the Left Book Club didn't publish him, a homage to Catalonia, didn't get published uh, in that quarter that could have done. Um, the, the book, in fact, is hardly read by anyone until after the Second World War. Homage to Catalonia, which Homage was his Catalonia, yes, yeah. description of what and he had. Animal Farm was, had a very, very hard time indeed getting a publisher because of the efforts of someone we now know to have been a KGB agent mm. in the British Ministry of Information, a man named Peter Smollett, alias Smolka, who tirelessly worked to put around the idea among wartime publishers that Orwell, in criticizing the great Soviet ally, was undermining the war effort against Hitler. Um, a line which actually, and here is, if you like, a literary, historical, cultural irony, which also seems to have persuaded T.S. Eliot, who, though he was a friend of Orwell's and had been invited by Orwell to appear on his BBC show, given every opportunity by him, though he was a well-known reactionary, uh, to air his views, um, declined to publish Animal Farm on the grounds that it was anti-Soviet. Uh, so that... Orwell is in the position of being accused of selling himself out to the other side in order to get sales and publicity, and has then denied these things by the same people. <laughs> is it really? Uh... Well, it's it, it's it's a trope that others have gone through. Yeah, he, he got the last laugh, but he was. Can not... you go through a trope? It's a trope that's not unfamiliar to people who study this this phenomenon of Stalinism in in culture, in publishing, in the academy, elsewhere. He it's got a double the... negation. He got the last laugh, but he wasn't alive to really hear much of it or enjoy much of it, I guess. No, by the, and he gave away, actually, he gave, he gave away to, as I told you, I mean, as, um, Ukrainian and Polish and <coughs> Serb, anti-communist, usually socialist, social democratic groups gave him the right to publish him for free if it would help the cause. Um, eventually would have made some money out of 1984, but wouldn't make the changes that were required by the Book of the Month Club in America and the Reader's Digest to Animal Farm um, for their nomination. So uh, signed away vast numbers of royalties because he, he wouldn't amend the book to make it anti-communist in the way that they thought it ought to be. Good choice. With well, an eye toward history, not toward his, the quality of his dinner and his, his flat, but... he. Really, it's, it's a strange thing. He doesn't really seem to have cared. I mean, if you'd offered him a car, say, he wouldn't particularly have known what to do with it. If you'd said you could have a house twice as big as the one you live in, you'd say, well, actually, the one I live in is all I want. Um, it may be nice to be immune from certain temptations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was uh, intrigued to see in, in the book that Orwell had reviewed The Road to Serfdom uh, what was his view of, of Hayek and Hayek's uh, worries about totalitarianism? The, the role played by Friedrich August von Hayek in British politics in 1944-45 is a forgotten episode now, but it was at the time of huge importance. Winston Churchill made a speech in the 1945 election, he having vanquished the Nazi empire, or helped to do so, having led the British people through very hard times saying that the plan of the Labour Party to institute national health care and other comparable socializing reforms might be all very well in its way, but would in practice require, and he said this advisedly, and I would say ill-advisedly, a Gestapo of bureaucracy to implement. That you couldn't have national health care without black uniform jackbooted enforcers. Well, the British working class was actually in no mood to be talked to in that tone of voice by then. It had been through the slump after the First World War where it had lost the flower of its young man in the trenches on the Western Front for not very much gain. Through the general strike, through the collapse of the gold standard, all of these things, by the way, identified very much with Winston Churchill. Um, 
through the long conservative collapse in front of fascism, through a bloody awful war, where they'd been, uh, what housing they had had been bombarded, when a lot of them hadn't even been allowed to join the armed forces, they were so ill. There were so many people with deficiency diseases, things like rickets, bad teeth, poor eyesight, I mean, third world health conditions. They were pretty determined to vote that the end of the war would bring the end of this sort of regime of neglect. And then to be told that they were voting for a Gestapo was just a, a little much. Didn't it, sell so well. Churchill's rhetoric wasn't always as golden as some people think. Anyway, it is said, perhaps unjustly, that that speech was suggested to uh, Churchill by Hayek himself. I have some reason to doubt it, but it, it certainly was influenced by what Hayek had written in The Road to Serfdom. And Hayek did have a position as some kind of consultant at that point, Conservative Central Office to the Research Department of the Tory party. So he got blamed for what became known as the Gestapo speech. And there's no doubt in my mind the Gestapo speech helped Churchill to lose that election. Though I'm pretty certain the Tories, under any leadership, would have lost that one uh, for historical reasons. At any rate, at around that time, David Astrid, the Observer, has the clever idea of asking Orwell to review the road to serfdom. By the way, I just say, entre parenthèses, in parenthesis, it's, it's the sort of difference a good editor can make. Is think, okay, there's this book by this relatively unknown Austrian. I wonder who'd make a good reviewer for it. Think of Orwell. Because it leaps off the page when you see it in the collected Orwell. Orwell on Hayek. Who thought of asking him to do that? <laughs> yeah. It's short piece. Uh, it's, it shows that he's clearly read and understood the book. Um, and he begins by saying, this is the wrong book at the wrong time. Um, the working class has been through fascism, war, slump, mass unemployment. It much prefers the risks that are run by state intervention to the risks that are posed by continuation of laissez-faire or capitalism as they used to know it. And they've, they've made up their minds to this. However, he then adds, uh, almost as an afterthought, um, it would be stupid to ignore the point that Professor von Hayek is making. He probably didn't say von, probably said Professor Hayek is making. Which is that if a certain share of the national income and the gross domestic product passes under state control past a certain point, that will become a tyranny. And the citizen will lose his liberty, and if he loses that, he may even also lose his welfare. I mean, uh, the, it's not unlike the, the Benjamin Franklin admonition, you know, don't trade liberty for security because you may end up with neither. I don't know. It would be nice to think that was in Orwell's mind too. But anyway, there it is. And, and this at a time when the, the social democratic, at any rate, consensus among the British intellectuals, including the conservative ones, is almost 100%. So once again, he manages to be the one who is just slightly out of step, just slightly not in tune, who can see beyond the view that that um, welfare state Toryism or um, conservative social democracy is the most one can expect from an economy of society now. On. You know, as someone who would like to see the world move toward a smaller role for government, government spending, it is remarkable how much freedom we have preserved. Uh, you know, there's disputes about how free we really are, half empty, half full, but it, it seems to me that the worst fears are, are not realized, at least yet. And yet government grows bigger uh, every, every few years in the United States, and Europe it may start to reach a level where people are going to push back a little bit, but it doesn't seem to be obvious. <clears throat> um, Harold Lasky who, uh, the old socialist and strong advisor to the Labour Party in that same election, who I think alternated in the chair at the London School of Economics with Hayek, I could be wrong about that, used to say in response to Hayekian and Churchillian criticism, look, if you can plan for tyranny, if you can plan for state control, if you can plan for authority, perhaps you can plan for freedom as well. I mean, it's, if you, the, it's not inevitable that planning is only a one-way street. I think a lot of people felt comforted by that and thought, well, freeing people from fear 
some simple terror that if they got sick, that would be the end of their lives. They couldn't, it wouldn't just be the end of their lives physically as healthy people, but they wouldn't have a job or a house either. Everything would go. They couldn't raise their children. They couldn't educate them. Take that away by some government intervention. Are you saying people are less free or more? More. Come on. Um, this, uh, this went, I'm, on, I'm, I'm this went on working, I think, as, with the, as did analogous concepts such as the New Deal. Didn't begin to hit diminishing returns until quite late. Um, Churchill's uh, view, therefore, was considered by many people alarmist, and the Conservative Party went out of its way to drop it for a long time. Orwell was more worried by state control over things like the media and the war economy. Rightfully so. Yeah. What, what, when he thought of an overmighty state, he thought of things like the nuclear state. In fact, one of, one of his very best short essays is written in, 19, I think, 46. Maybe it could be late 45. It's, it's post Nagasaki, post Hiroshima. And it's called You and the Nuclear Bomb. Or You and the Atom, sorry, it would have been called The Atom Bomb. You and the Atom Bomb. He gets a lot of work done in a few hundred words. And he says, of course the immediate fear is that of annihilation and apocalypse. But there's another fear that one might pay attention to that no one's drawn attention to yet. What if this kind of weaponry makes the state completely invulnerable? So that no guerrilla warfare, no, no insurrection, no revolution could ever overthrow it. it the state would be armored behind a sort of, he doesn't say plutonium, but behind a, a shield that was impenetrable. It would, it would lead necessarily to um, a, t a tyranny which would have the horrible idea of being unoverthrowable. It's an interesting issue. It's an yes. interesting observation. Though he was certainly, I mean, uh, as many leftists, Ab initio are supposed to be, and Marxism is the first ideology to pronounce the idea in so many words of the withering away of the state, of replacing the government of men with the administration of things, as Marx puts it very well. I think it's in the 1844 manuscript. And this, this, the sight of this had been lost by the struggle to replace predatory and fascistic capitalism and imperialism with social democratic government, where government was considered axiomatically good for that reason. But the idea was that one should always have a weather eye to the overmighty state. Suddenly, at the end of the war, the, the earth appears to be covered in military superpowers, whose rivalry, this is Orwell's great insight, may conceal a secret sympathy they have with one another and a common interest in maintaining a balance of terror. Um, there, were, there were moments in the Cold War where one was forced to think that that might be what was going on, that the Cold War had become about itself only, and no, no larger or nobler subject. It was never quite true, but it was never quite untrue either. Well, certainly. And there were certainly managers of it, people like Henry Kissinger, for example, I would nominate, and possibly uh, Hal Sonnenfeld who felt far more sympathy with the managers of crisis in Beijing and in Moscow than they did with um, troublesome movements in subordinate countries like Czechoslovakia or Vietnam. So the Orwell, Orwell's never completely wrong. And even when he's wrong, he's got hold of an insight that needs to be retained. So he was, in your mind, a leftist, but he was also... A radical, certainly. He was embraced by the right. A radical, certainly, and because of his emergence out of a family um, and a society uh, that he had every reason to distrust. I mean, his father, after all, had made a living out of selling Indian opium under British imperial auspices to China. He was compelled to buy it, and it's not... It's very fascinating that there's no mention of any father in any of Orwell's works, not at all. It, uh, except very occasional, very distant, and always very negative references. Even when he describes England as a family with the wrong members in control. So we, okay, we're a family, but the wrong members in control. He, he describes various... Uh, poor relations and uh, aunts are horribly sat upon and various rich cousins and so on and who are 
awfully kowtowed and deferred. There's, there's no father in this uh, At family. least he called it Big Brother. Could have been worse. The, then you see <laughs> it's Big Brother, whereas obviously the analogy to the totalitarian dictatorship is the, is the unchanging eternal father. Yep. But he's already, he's already coped with that by an early essay in which he says that he, his, his initial problem with Christianity, I think this is in Such, Such Were the Joys, his book about his prep school, was that you had to love a father figure who you also had to fear. An insuperable problem for Christianity, of course, that he saw, he saw coming right away. Um, but so we know that he was fond of his mother. We know that he couldn't bring himself to talk about his father, um, and that his general attitude to family life was somewhat distraught. <laughs> Uh, but uh, why do I, yes? So, because his his hatred for imperialism, for for British uh, class snobbery um, and hypocrisy, for the, the, all the so-called vices and so-called virtues, he thought advisers of the suburban, small-time aspirant, those who hated the working class but feared and groveled to the class immediately above them. It, he was not going to be able to express his dissent in a conservative form. No, he had no choice but to move to the left and to the underdogs and the working class. Um, that's why it's interesting that when he sees that Hayek has a critique of illegitimate power, even though it comes from the right wing, that he's, he's at once able to summarize in a few sentences what that critique is. And the virtue of it. And the virtue of it. And the virtue of it, yeah. Well, he, he strikes Indeed, yes. yeah. all, I guess, as a uh, a truth teller, which is part of the power of facing and part of the integrity you talk about in the book. I forget now who it is he writes about, um, but I, I came across it looking for something else the other night. He's writing about someone whose religious opinions he finds ridiculous, even contemptible, but he says there's something charming about the person. And he said if, if, if all Christians were like this guy, uh, the reputation of religion might not be my mind might not have sunk as low as it has. I, I'm paraphrasing this poorly, but um, he was always uh, willing to be fair to an individual, even if that person represented a cause or a party that he found um, objectionable. We're almost out of time. I want to turn to Christopher Hitchens, who strikes me as a somewhat Orwellian figure used in a complimentary way, a hmm. uh, mix of apparent contradictions. Um, someone who's taken political stands that I'm sure have cost you some calumny. Um, maybe not up to the level of Orwell's, or maybe, I don't know. But um, do you see yourself in his footsteps? Is no, no, I've had to write very firmly about this because I, some people have very kindly said what you just said. And others less kindly have said, aha, Hitchens wants the mantle of Orwell and so forth, which, by which they don't intend a compliment. It's non-Orwellian in that way. Um, it's a paradox. Uh, <laughs> and I say, well, both uh, for whatever reason, kindness and generosity, or it's obvious that anyone, anyone might want to say this. It wouldn't be true. I mean, the most conspicuous thing about Orwell, I think, is his moral courage. He, he never had a steady publisher. He never had a steady job. He never had a steady income. He was always ill. Um, he was always um, insecure, and he often had to risk, and did risk, his life. I haven't had to do any of these things. And I have a hard time filling the quota of stuff that people want me to write and publish. I mean, I always got something I'm supposed to be doing that I, that for which there's a space already reserved once I've written it. Um, that wasn't always true, I have to say, but my, my, my struggle in the garret wasn't a very epic one. Well, you've lived past um, 46, so never, that helps. And also, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I would have been dead um, uh, 14 years ago if I was him. Having had the last few years of that life rendered very horrible by, by poverty and, and illness and unhappiness. So I've never had to find out how I would shape up if I was threatened with 
poverty or imprisonment or death um, or obscurity if I carried on the way I was. I've never had to know what that would be like. So, you know, the comparison is absurd. However, I don't mind saying, and I think it's clear to some people, that ever since I first read him, everything he's had to say has weighed with me. Um, and if that didn't show, I would be surprised. Um, I've, he must be the person I most often quote or cite, quite unashamedly. Um, uh, using it, I hope, as much for support as for illumination. I was thinking this morning of something, actually, while I was write, trying to write my own memoir. The job of the intellectual, the so-called public intellectual, as we're now for some reason doomed to call it, is or ought to be to say something along the following lines, it's more complicated than that. You mustn't simplify this. It's more, there's more complexity to the subject. That, that's what an intellectual should be doing to public discourse, one thinks. But then there are occasions when it seems to me that the, the, the reverse is the case, that actually what the, the really thoughtful person should be saying to you is actually it's simple. Couldn't agree more. Do not <laughs> make complexity here where none is required. Um, I was trying to imagine what Barack Obama would say if he was asked about Salman Rushdie. Would he say, of course I'm for free expression over religious sensibilities every time? He wouldn't be able to do it, I suddenly realized. He's never been asked. But in his campaign to remake our relationship with the Muslim world, no one's ever asked him the fatwa question. Could he just give a straight reply? And no dancing around. I bet you he could not. A tough one. Whereas the critical, the most boring thing I ever said about Salman Rushdie was, um, was the only thing I wanted to say, which was, you have to be on his side. There's no other side you can possibly be on. Don't accuse me of Something not, complicated I, do, there. I understand what complexities people want to introduce, but I'm, I'm here to repudiate them and say, no, no, keep it simple. Orwell's very good in that way. Um, it's very hard to tell what the truth is, and some people even say that you can't quite do that, that there may not even be such a thing as objective truth. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try for it, but crucially, it doesn't mean the following attempted corollary, which is you wouldn't know a lie when you saw one. You, you may not be able to tell the truth every time. Not tell it, I mean detect it. Yeah. Uh, identify it. But you sure can identify a lie. And if you refuse yourself the lie, say, I just won't tell any, even if it suits me, or my cause, I won't do it. I make that simple renunciation. It's amazing what you'll have to do instead. This is, some people might say, simplistic. But in that case, then the word simplistic deserves an upgrade. I was just brooding on this this morning, and I realized that being even able to think or argue in this way, even if it's not very profound, does have its utility. And I get it, at any rate, from the visible, palpable relationship within the writing of Orwell between language, truth, and logic, between um, plain, honest... Uh, speech, uh, transparent political positions, um, detestation for euphemism and for, for falsification. They get you a long way. Lionel Trilling says in his introduction to Homage to Catalonia, the first time the book was ever published in the United States, long after Orwell was dead, he said that the great thing about Orwell is he's not a hero. He's uncomfortable for that reason, because he shows what anyone can do with just a few resources. You know, the ability to write, the, the, the power of facing unpleasant facts, the refusal of the lie, and a bit of moral and physical guts, as we used to say in English schools. Courage. Uh, you can peel away all the flummery of fascism, colonialism, Stalinism, religion, um, just like that. And of course, people hate this because they think only a hero can do this. So they're excused. They don't have to. No, no, no. There are no excuses. You could have done this too with a bit of effort, a bit more self-criticism, a bit more use of your own faculties. You could have done it too. I make this point in my book, and uh, Richard Posner wrote a, an excoriating attack on me. Very clever. As a result, what do you mean he wasn't a hero? He went to Spain, he took a bullet in the throat, 
He threw up a job when he had no other job to go to. He fought off illness. He wrote three great, two certainly very great novels, um, hundreds of very great essays. Are you saying this is an ordinary guy? Well, actually, I think I can have that both ways. Yes, I think I can say that it shows how the qualities of heroism and virtue are accessible to ordinary people if they will absolutely keep driving themselves and not excusing themselves or making excuses for others. Um, and this is why the, the qualities that he evinces uh, are going to remain important to us as long as the English language is used, which I don't know how far I'm trespassing now on your time, but uh, another little thing he got completely right, writing to his friend Mulgra Janand, a writer in Bombay who'd been working for the BBC uh, Indian service, and who was attacked in India for writing novels in English, saying you're using the conqueror's language, you're using the language of the white man. And he was attacked in England for being a babu, a sort of wannabe white man, who was really a warp. Um, in disguise, and Orwell said, pay no attention to this. It doesn't matter how you're insulted, you'll get insults from both sides of this. But what, what's going to happen with it, and it'll happen quite soon, is there will be a whole department of English literature written by Indians. And great advances in the novel and, and in fiction in general, in criticism will be made. Um, and it'll be like American literature, yes. it'll be a whole a subject in itself. Yeah, he re must have written that to Anand in the mid-40s. Now, no literate person can go into a bookstore and not see, or not have read, or picked up by now, something by Rohinton Mystery or Salman Rushdie or Hanif Qureshi or... Um, I'm running out of the names. Oh, well, um, uh, Vikram Said. Um, I've just forgotten the... Vidya Naipaul, where well, he's from Trinidad, but yes. And Shiva Naipaul, also from Trinidad, but yes, of the Indian diaspora, of course. Um, and others who I'm sure I haven't even heard of, who are Indians writing in Uganda, mm -hmm. uh, in, probably in English, or in South Africa. It, it's un undoubtedly there are names I don't know. Um, very interesting and very clever to have noticed that, that on the, on the thing they prided themselves in most, their language, the, in, uh, the English could be outbid, outdone. <laughs> outdone by people who they'd look down upon. I mean, and it's really true. Arundhati Roy, I have huge disagreements with a lot of what she writes, but she writes it very beautifully. Um, Gita Mehta, another great woman Indian writer. So, um, yes, language, truth, logic. A certain attachment to historical irony, I think, is important understanding some of the laws of unintended consequences. If you do this, you can go a long way. My guest today has been Christopher Hitchens. Thanks for being part of Econ Talk. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.